Happy Monday, everybody. It is a, another Monday, of course, and that means it is Mix in a Water Monday. And joining us today is former Gamecock quarterback Michael Skarnecchia, which you can catch occasionally on the GC Live postgame show. And he was on the show the other night as we discussed South Carolina's loss to Tennessee before the Gamecocks now head into the bye week. Mike, just obviously we recapped a lot of that game the other night. Yeah. But being able to take a step back now and reevaluate things, and I know it doesn't really change a lot, just what was your overall thoughts on what we saw from South Carolina in terms of, okay, you gain some momentum, you take a step forward after beating Mississippi State. You're able to do some good things. You get the, ra- the, the ground game going. You're able to run the football a little bit. Defensive line, they were able to get some tackles for a loss. They were able to get some sacks. Then you go into Knoxville. you got to play a tough Tennessee team, and you just come out flat, especially in that second half. Yeah. Well, I think you – what you said is exactly correct. What we need to do is going forward, especially during this bye week, we need to focus on when we're facing a good D line. I think we get a, we've seen that our tackles struggle and our offensive line struggles. So we need to find ways to incorporate ways, especially maybe using tight ends or backs to help chip the um, the defensive ends when they're rushing through because it will help give Spencer more time. We know with Spencer we have one of the best QBs in the nation when he has time. But it's hard to be – You it depend, does not matter who you put back there. If you don't give the QB time, they're not going to be able to utilize their – you know, the, the offense. They're not going to be able to operate efficiently. It's just how it is. So we need to find ways to continue to help the, the tackles to give Spencer some more time because when we do face a tough D-line, as I said, we struggle. Now, run game, it's good to see Mario Anderson get back there and finally establish a run game because right now we're last in the SEC in rushing yards. But that's also – you're factoring in the first couple games when we weren't – running the ball effectively at all. I think that you're going to see that continually uh, continue to improve with Mario Anderson, but we just need to find creative ways to utilize our run game. And that's going to help one with the pass protection and two with the pass offense, because teams are going to have to adjust to how well, if we're running well, they're going to have to adjust their box. They're going to, have to adjust what type of coverage they're running. So we need to become more effective in the run game and continue hammering down on giving the ball to Mario so we can help our pass game in that protection. Now for the defense, like you said, We saw some really good things against Mississippi State. We also saw, even in Georgia, we saw a good defensive performance overall for the past two weeks. And then I think from our front seven. And then going into this game, our front seven, I think, had more of a weaker game considering the span of the five games that we've played. And, you know, I hope they get it together and they find things to click against Florida. But that front seven is going to have to figure some things out. They weren't setting the edge. Our DBs, for the most part, were playing well. They were getting the ball back you know, playing tight coverage, breaking his pass ups, got two turnovers. And so we were giving our offense the ball. One, our offense needs to become more effective, but two, our defensive, our front seven needs to become more effective with one, setting the edge and stopping the run and two, getting to the QB. Those are a couple of things that I thought were a recap that we can, can, going into the bye week, we can improve on or at least hone down on. I don't want to be Mr. Wishy-Washy. And if you disagree with me, then 1000% just come out and say it. I've been very pleased, especially heading into the Tennessee game. So let's take a step back. Mm -hmm. I've been very pleased with the play calling from Dow Loggins because I think the majority of us understand that it's kind of like being in a kitchen. I think I've used this analogy before. It's like, all right, you want to cook a steak, but if you only have the ingredients to freaking make cereal, then you can only make cereal. You know, you're not going to be able to make a filet mignon. So I say that because obviously early on in the season, we start week one against North Carolina. There's been some issues up front with the offensive line trying to figure that out obviously it's still an issue to a point where it's not allowing your star quarterback to make plays when he obviously has protection we've seen how good he is we always obviously talked the other night as well mike about receivers needing to create separation but i bring that because where are you as we head into this bye week because yes it's five games through but as we go into a bye week i feel like that's always a good time to talk about these things where are you in terms of the play calling from Dow Loggins, what are you liking from it? What would you like to see a little bit more from as they come out of the bye week? And obviously there's differences in comparison to where this offense was a year ago in the last two years with a different play caller. Yeah, I think one thing we're doing well is we're, we're trying to get the ball out of Spencer's hands quickly, knowing what the offensive line's production is, how inconsistent it is right now. I think we need to continue to find ways to get the ball out of Spencer's hands quickly and in our playmaker's hands, which we've done for the most part. Last game against Tennessee, we didn't you didn't see that as much. I think Tennessee had a good game plan against us, so we should have adjusted and found ways maybe to focus on the run game. 
One, because they were getting so fast in the backfield against Spencer and putting that pressure on him. The run game could have put us in situations where it was a third and short or a second and medium or whatever the case is. But in those situations, you can expect more man coverage from a team rather than zone. And then you can adjust and get the ball out in quick routes. And that's going to help Spencer. But the run game is effective. I think going forward, we need to – I think – even though our run game has been effective, the few attempts we've got, we've only rushed it 10, 15 times total, I think, across uh, each game for the past two games when we've had Mario Anderson in. We keep get, we need to keep giving them the ball. He's effective. He's going to help put our offense in situations on down and distances that could be effective with doing the short passes. I think Dow has also done a good job with the screens. I think when, when we go, when you see those little tunnel screens that we're doing in the RPO style, we're pretty effective in that aspect. We need to continue doing that, but we don't need to focus too much on that because defenses are going to start playing up. So I think we're going forward. We also are going to need to see some more big shot plays. We've seen it now in the past a couple of times. We saw it against Mississippi State with Xavier Leggett. We saw it a couple of times in the past. When I said past, like a couple of previous games. So I think we need to continue seeing those big shot plays, but those big shot plays aren't going to be a setup. You can't run those until we set those up with effective running and also effective short game passing. But we just need to help out our offensive line in any way we can. And also, I think we're going to have to start incorporating a tight end on who, whatever side of the line that is not – who's being inconsistent with their blocking. And they're just struggling for that night. So we're going to have to help out our offensive tackles, give Spencer some more time, and then set up those big shots because we have the athletes who can go downfield and make those catches. When you look at what we saw the other day, right, it seemed like there was a lot of underneath – uh, a lot of crossing routes, trying to use the speed Xavier will get. And obviously you go back to the Mississippi State game. We talked about this on the post game show, 98-yard drive, 99-yard drive. And mm-hmm. a lot of that had to do with what USC was able to do underneath and stuff that they didn't do for the last two years under Marcus Satterfield when he was the play caller. I bring that up because you have this bye week, Mike, and kind of explain to people what's going on during this week, especially five weeks in, because Juice Wells – even if he does come back, it's still going to probably be another couple of weeks, if that. Going into the season, you expect that juice is going to be 100%. You're expecting the offensive line to be, okay, has some question marks, but you're expecting your right tackle not to go down the second series of the game. So I bring that up because now you understand that one of your top receivers, your top receiver, and that's no disrespect to Xavier because Xavier's obviously been incredible, but your top receiver's out. He's able to stretch the field. Xavier has been able to carry that torch and has been able to do a lot of things for you. But because other guys have been banged up like Marion Brown, USC's had to do multiple things with with X. So what's going on this week in terms of what they're probably thinking of? And I know you don't know the exact um, game plan, but just based on your experience of heading into bye weeks and based on what you've seen, what what do you think we can expect from the Gamecocks coming out of the bye week? Well, you hope to see a team that's more fresh. So bye weeks are usually a time to utilize the time that you have to give your younger players some reps, some much needed reps that they maybe aren't getting in the games. Or if they are getting in the games, it's time to help them hone in on the aspects of their game that they can improve on. Because again, young guys are going to make mistakes. And if they're on the field making those reps, you can continue to focus on this and coach them up. The week of the bye week usually is kind of a you're facing your defense your defense is facing your offense you're not really game planning a a scout team and having them face or run the defense or the offense that you're facing so this week's gonna be big on one you know a lot of people are asking the question about why is nick harbour not out there you see what he looked like on that one image they posted them coming out of the tunnel guy looks like a freak we already know how fast he is one i guarantee is he's just not mentally ready for the game it's probably very fast for him he's not grasping the offensive um the offensive calls and the routes that he's supposed to run with those attached calls. So this is a time to get guys like Nicholas Harbour and the other young guys just to focus more, get some more film rep or some more film prep, and then also get them on the field and just get some more reps. Because reps are really, as much as you want to study on on paper the plays that you have, it's no comparison to what you're going to learn on the field getting those actual reps. So it's going to be a time for our young guys to get it. It's also going to be a time for our more senior players who are starting one to just get a step, take a step back, get healthy a little as much as they can in the week, and also help, go in the film room and study more. Figure out where they need to improve. The coaches are going to also take this time to one improve their game plans, plan for the next team, figure out where they're continually weak and how they can 
maybe game plan some other people. So bye weeks are big, and one, they get the young guys more reps. Two, it gets the senior guys who are who are playing a bunch to get them some much needed rest and more film prep. And so it's going to be a big week going into Florida because I think Florida is going to be a pivotal game whether we, you know, potentially go for bowl eligibility or not. Mike, I want to read some stats to you. And I know the thing about stats, most of the time you can read a number, you can say a stat, you can make it into whatever narrative you want. But when you read stats like this, I feel like it tells the majority of the story that we've seen through five weeks. So uh, South Carolina, when it comes to total defense, they're last in the SEC. Pass defense, last in the SEC. Tackles for a loss, last in the SEC. Actually one of the fewer number of tackles for a loss in the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, You keep going down, scoring defense, 11th in the conference, rush defense, 11th in the conference, third down rate, 12th in the conference. I bring all this up because, and I mentioned on the post game show, we can also talk about the offensive line being young too. Certainly youth plays a role as to why some of these things are happening, but at the same time too, at some point, you can't just keep pointing to that, especially when it's not just 12, excuse me, 11 freshmen out there. I'm getting ahead of myself thinking of Texas and I'm the 12th man. But you, you don't have 11 freshmen out there. You do have a lot of young guys, but at some point you have to be able to make improvements. I feel like with this defense, and I know I brought him up the other night, I'm going to bring him up again because I'm still very high on him. And we've seen many players through South Carolina over the last couple of years. I've Think of Cam Smith. Think of Xavier Leggett, who maybe had struggles early on in their career, and they were able to bounce back, and they had phenomenal careers, right? So I think Stone Bland is going to be one of those players. Stone, it's kind of like a roller coaster. And, again, I'm using him as an example just because I'm, I'm very high on this young man. Some weeks he's off. Some weeks he has phenomenal games, and then he you know struggles like last night. So I bring that up because what can USC do during this bye week to be able to correct some of that because as we mentioned last night, they did a lot of good things. USC's offense didn't help them out at times. But at the same time, too, especially early in the first half, they didn't help themselves out. They weren't able to get off the field. I mentioned some of those stats. They weren't able to get off the field on a lot of those crucial third down situations, which allowed Tennessee to extend drives. Yeah, I think a lot of it really is just putting yourself in the right position. I think right now White needs to find a way to find these guys to – one, just be in the right position. Because if you're in the right position, it's much easier to make a tackle. I think plenty of time, I think I, one, I saw one article I read, and I also saw it when I was just watching the game, we weren't setting the edge at all with our defensive ends and also our linebackers. We weren't filling the proper gaps. We were missing gaps. We were caving in on the wrong gap. It was just a lot of missed – it looked like a lot of missed assignments. And so I think one thing they need to do is just hone in on what their assignment is, their individual assignment. Don't try and go above and beyond. Be smart about the play. Know what your role is and react. I think too many times we're just seeing these guys who I think they're missing assignments and a lot of it really could come down to coaching. And, you know, while the players are young and Mike, I agree with you, we can't keep blaming on being young. At some point they need to mature up and start knowing what their role is, what their assignments are and performing. So I think our DBs are playing for the most part fairly well. There's some games where they get exposed, but I think it's also because we're not putting pressure on the QBs. The QBs have a bunch of time back there. Without the tackles for loss, without the the QB pressures, we almost always need to dial up a blitz if we want to put a pressure on a QB. So we have the players we have. We can look at our young guys and see who we can get in there. Maybe if we want to burn a red shirt, but a lot of those guys probably aren't really ready. So we need to find ways to get our guys to be more effective. I think we need to continue to bring blitzes because those have seemed to be effective when we when we blitz and we get, we put pressure on the QBs because we we're, you know, we're going to face some good QBs going forward. So we need to find ways to get pressure. It just puts more opportunity for our defense to one, get a turnover against them. And two, it, it could disrupt the entire flow of the pass of the offense where they now need to adjust what they're doing because they have no protection, but we also just need to focus on their assignment. Our coaches need to continue. Just, just continue to coach that. If we set the edge, Tennessee probably doesn't have as many rushing yards as they have against us. There were too many times where they were just looking for inside zone, bouncing out and going. So this bye week, what White needs to do is tell all these coaches, tell the D-line coaches, tell our linebacker coaches, let's watch film, figure out where we're going to be, where we have been weak, and just continue to hone in on 
our assignments so we don't make the same mistakes continually going forward because I think you and me have talked about this. It's just inconsistency. Yep. And the inconsistency comes to one, lack of preparation, and two, not knowing your assignments. So if you hone in on those two things and you guys, you can get your guys to really buy into um, to learning and focusing and improving those two sets of or those two areas, then I guarantee you're going to see a lot of improvement on our defense in most of the statistical areas you showed. My God, uh, and I'm glad you brought it up because some people didn't listen to the, the GCLI post game show. I'm sure that are watching this. Some have, but now we're hitting that point where we're five games into the season, especially coming out of the bye week where guys are going to get redshirted. Guys are going to know. And God forbid, unless someone gets injured and you have to throw someone in there, you have to make the best decision for not only that individual, but you have to make the best decision for the program moving forward. So don't be shocked to see some of these guys who may have hit that four-game threshold this past game or even through the first four games not be used moving forward unless they're playing in a bowl game and the NCAA does what they did last year, which they changed the rule at the last minute because everyone's entering the transfer portal injuries, more so to help out the offensive line and defensive line. But we will see. He's Michael Skarnecchia. Appreciate you hopping on today, Mike. And again, if you want to listen to Mike after some of these games this year, be sure to join us on the GC Live post-game show as Mike gives us some of his analysis, the former Gamecock quarterback, a lot of good insight, and you're also able – to ask him some questions as well. Mike, always a pleasure, man. Appreciate you hopping on. Appreciate you, Mike.